Thank you. Science communication is often thought of as the process of simplifying science or using metaphors or somehow making it more engaging so that it's more accessible to the public. Many people are concerned about the public engagement with science, technology, engineering, and math because this is a kind of a sciencey thing. That's an acronym called STEM. People are getting more interested in adding A to this acronym. A stands for art.、Um, Now it's called STEAM. There are academic papers written on whether or not those letters are in the right order. Maybe it should be teams because it's so collaborative. I was one of those academics writing and publishing about this area that we care a great deal about. And then I met somebody from the entertainment industry, and he, in a very nice way, said, "Why are you talking to yourselves?" And from that day onward, I have been working differently. And by differently, I mean beakerhead style. Hey! We're pretty serious about this smash-up. It's hands-on, walk, don't talk, show, don't tell. In the process of building this space at the crossroads of art, science, and engineering, we've come face to face with some evolutionary forces that, at first, seemed so obvious they didn't merit mentioning, and then we realized they're so easy to take for granted that they require constant attention. And the first one is that delight is reason enough. Delight is reason enough to do things. It, it starts conversations. It starts relationships. It starts companies. I mean, think about it. When was the last time you had a good idea when you were in a bad mood? Art and science are their own thing. Same with engineering. They're their own disciplines.、They're, they have a subculture and hierarchies and structures in place, so you can create excellence in each of those areas, which is important and awesome. It's when you bring them together that something else happens. That's pure delight, and like nothing, that nothing of the ingredients going into them. I mean, look at El Popo. Yes, it's an artwork, but it's not being evaluated as an artwork. And there's tons of engineering in this, but engineers aren't holding it up as a model of fantastic engineering. It's just delightful. Or Beaker Night. Yes, there is science and engineering and art on that street. But it's the smash-up that attracts tens of thousands. You call this a dog, I call it a musical note. This dog is in the dog orchestra. It is music, it's art, and it's also engineering. These dogs are wired up to a computer. They are not harmed. <laughs> I want to show you more of what it is like to smash together these things. But before I do, I just need. Say something that it isn't, and I, the only reason I bring this up is that we've we've encountered it quite a bit. This, what we're doing here at the crossroads of art, science, and engineering, is not a celebration or a showcase or a festival. It's just a thing. It's a new thing. It's it's like think of having a cup of tea. It, it's not a showcase of hot drinks. It's not a celebration of British culture. It's just having a cup of tea. And that's the way we think of Beakerhead. It's like learning to make a great cup of coffee with Phil from Phil and Sebastian's. Yes, it is a delightful experience, and it involves chemistry. The second force that we realized was crucial and important, and every day and yet underrecognized, is that recognizing good ideas is more important than having them. That fellow I mentioned, who said, "Why are you talking to yourself?" That is my co-founder of Beakerhead, Jay Ingram, and <laughs> he was—he has been instrumental in getting things to flourish around him because he's a guy that says, "Yeah, that's a good idea." He recognizes good ideas. I remember distinctly the afternoon in our home office. We had been talking about doing a public live science thing and wondered, you know. Was this city ready? Were people willing to collaborate? And the name Beaker had just popped up in my head, and I kind of floated it out there. He thought for a minute and said, "Yeah, that's a great idea." And that 
made a huge difference. The people around you, they're not just your support network, they are game changers. Here's a group of game changers who started the first dog orchestra, my family. <laughs> they were conscripted, and you'll be happy to know that Calgary Philharmonic has recognized this is a good idea, and they've stepped in to help us this year to dial up this kind of chaos that you see. You know the expression, the second mouse gets the cheese? We, d we don't like that because we don't like thinking about what happened to the first mouse. <laughs> so we just say the second mouse is as important as the first mouse. The third force is that you just have to keep moving. From the moment we had that aha moment in the home office to the first speakerhead in 2013 was five years. There were many, many, many opportunities and reasons just to, to let it go away. But the deeper and deeper we got into it, the more we realized that, you know, we're streaming people, and we still are streaming kids and people into science or art. And there are holes and gaps. It's, people are not able to be their full selves. We have sectors of, uh, of the city, silos of engineering that doesn't support arts and vice versa. We have a university full of research, a large amount of which doesn't get off the campus. So it became almost irresponsible to not pursue this. We had hundreds and hundreds of meetings. We were way invested by the time we met this one city builder, a very visionary person, who said, you can do this. You, you have the skills, you know how to, you, you, you can put this together. But you can't make it happen. You need visionary, you need a visionary champion who can mobilize the money for you. And you know what? We never found that person. Sometimes you just have to keep moving and use brute force. The next force that we found, this really gets to the guts of what we do when we're programming Beakerhead. Separate ide ideas from their owners. It's not about the owners, it's about the audience experience. This takes self-discipline and ego management to work this way, but we put the ideas in the middle of the table and separate them from the people around the table. And then we start to upgrade. This is our work. Any amateur can spot a flaw. It takes a professional to be able to provide a solution, and that is our work. So we upgrade and we upgrade. We don't call what we do curating. We're afraid that, you know, we do bring things in, but we are trying to build things with people. And if we curated, we probably wouldn't get the people to these crossroads that we want to attract in the first place. Doing this work is uh, keeping us humble for two reasons. One, uh, no one's in control. <laughs> and two, it is uh, easy to get wrong. And we get it wrong in both directions. This was an engineered artwork that we brought to East Village a couple of years ago. We were worried that nobody would go, and we, would, we planned all sorts of programming, like bringing in the minister and having artist talks so people would attend. In fact, this had a two-hour lineup from the day it opened on Thursday to when it closed on Sunday. And it hurt your hands. <laughs> so it was spectacularly popular. So we started to think, well, we better get ready for lineups. And we were planning last year this giant claw, like a 30-foot claw game. Who's not going to love that? We would started to think about how to manage and entertain the lineups. And it, in the end, it did not have a lineup. It was delightful, but, I mean, maybe it looks unfinished. Uh, maybe people are still scarred by the rigged real claw game. We just, we got this one wrong. And then there's a lot of things we do, like the periodic table, that are, they're just so random and strange that they're hard to describe, and, and, and we work very hard to get people to buy tickets for things like this, and boy, that, it has been a tough sell. This is, in case it's not obvious, a dining room in midair, a Top Chef Canada food experience. There's a beautiful artwork cresting over Fort Calgary. There's a trailer there fueling that uh, Ferris wheel using vegetable oil from Calgary restaurants. There's a bar, molecular gastronomy cocktails, musicians. Like, it's just so random and cool. Uh, I don't know. 
I don't know whose brains that came out of in the middle of the table, but it was, uh, it was really fun. And lastly, this force of proportion became super clear to us. This is one of my favorite moments. In this rocket is a pretty famous rapper, Jizza from Wu-Tang Clan, a Canadian astronaut and a science communicator. Like, it's just a great combination of what we're trying to do. The proportions that we're really focusing on are equal parts creativity and equal parts rationality. That is the new proportion that's creating something at this crossroads that didn't exist before. Not very many people know how to do this well. And so I am very excited to tell you that Beakerhead is starting a school. Yay! <laughs> yeah. Uh, Cirque du Soleil has a school, the National Ballet has a school, so Beakerhead will have a school. The people who come to the school will not be students, but very you know, senior practitioners, scientists, doctors, vets, communications directors. And in a way, it'll be like uh, going to astronaut school. And I know this because David Saint-Jacques, the Canadian astronaut, told me what it's like to become uh, an astronaut. He said, um, excuse me, You have to keep in mind, this is a guy who has an engineering degree, and then he did his PhD in astrophysics. And after that, went to med school, and he was working up in the Arctic on remote medicine when he applied to the space program. And he said when he got to the first day of astronaut training, he was, it was like being in kindergarten again, because he had zero experience being an astronaut, just like every other overachiever in that starting class. So that's what it's going to be like at the uh, Beakerhead School. The one characteristic that we are going to focus on there is emotion. Lead with emotion. As I said, we're talking about an audience-focused audience uh, endeavor, a science communications endeavor that is purely audience-focused. And that is not an easy thing to do if you aren't, uh, you know, trained in understanding what delights. You have to understand that your audience might see things differently. The audience is made up of people. People are emotional. They bring emotions to everything, even scientific data, whether you like it or not. So in order to connect with them, you have to connect them, connect with them in their everyday lives and understand that they might not be seeing things the same way that you do. The forces of evolution are wondrous indeed. <laughs> we are hoping that the new playground of science, engineering and art that we're creating through Beakerhead will be a place where everyone can find their fullest potential. Thank you.